speaking with Dr. Patricia Maloney, who is an assistant, soon to be associate professor of the sociology of education at Texas Tech University. Um, several years ago, the Institute for Advanced Studies in Culture at UVA launched a major research project to better understand the moral formation of high school students. Um, researchers went to 10 different sectors of schools, from public schools, both urban and rural, to private schools, to home schools, um, and other kinds. Um, and Dr. Maloney was one of those researchers. She and her team focused on charter schools. Um, so as we get started talking today, I um, want to ask you, Dr. Maloney, thank you for joining us. Um, I want to here. ask you, yes, to, could you just give us a brief explanation of what charter schools are? Um, and then what um, character education looked like in the charter schools that you studied? Sure. So uh, charter schools are uh, technically public schools and that they do receive um, funding from public monies, from taxpayer monies, the same way that your more traditional public schools were. The difference with charter schools is that they are founded on a charter, hence the name. Um, I actually, when I explain this to my students, tell them to think of an X, Y, Z definition. Mm -hmm. Charter schools um, promise to the local board of education or, or to the state department of education, whatever the certifying entity is, that they will take X number of students for Y number of years and achieve Z test scores mm -hmm. in that Y number of years. Mm -hmm. And basically what they're saying is we're gonna take these students from your, your local traditional public school population. We um, are not gonna be bound by the rules of the traditional public schools, either in terms of teacher unions, in terms of the length of a school day, um, in terms of the type of curriculum that they have to use, um, or in terms of uh, what we require from parents. And then at the end of those years, we will have made that Z progress. Um, and so uh, taking some of the burden of students off the traditional public schools, um, but still returning, hopefully, not always, of course, it doesn't always happen, but hopefully better test score results than the traditional public schools. And of course, better results in terms of graduation rates um, and in terms of less uh, quantifiable metrics like culture. And that's, of course, where I got really interested in moral education, in the culture that, that's being taught there. Yeah, great. So thank you. Um, that's helpful. So what, um, well, first of all, I know that you studied six different charter schools, right? Yes. And I know they were really varied. Um, but what were some of the commonalities that you saw between those schools? Um, so it was really interesting. I mean, I, when I talk about charter schools, when I give talks about this, I always talk about the, the one thing that you know about charters, the one consistency about charters is that they're inconsistent. Um, and it's, it sounds flippant, but, but it's really, really the case. Charter schools at their very core are designed to be highly individualistic entities. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's a double-edged sword, right? Mm -hmm. um, if it goes really well, if the school is doing incredibly well, well, that, that highly individualistic, that very, uh, uh, that sense of freedom that comes along with being a charter school has worked out brilliantly for all the students and the administrators and teachers involved. On the other side of the coin, um, when it's not working so well, there's no safety net mm -hmm. that is necessarily found in the traditional public schools in terms of um, curricula or, or teachers unions or the ability to move administrators from or teach or students from one place to another. Some charter schools, now there are two types of charters. There are what's known as networked versus non-networked. Mm -hmm. The non-networked are the ones that are uh, their own little kingdom. Um, nobody is, is giving them any sort of uh, influence from outside. Whereas the network ones are your ones like KIPP, Achievement First, um, Green Dot, Uncommon Schools. They have a network, hence the reason network schools. And so they do get outside support or support that is external to the school affects okay. them. Mm -hmm. So to go back to your question about what did I notice about moral education? Um, and, and it was, oh my goodness, it was fascinating to watch this happen in six different schools and all the way across the country from um, Connecticut all the way to California. Um, I noticed that the schools were highly focused on need mm -hmm. um, and what the administrators and the teachers saw as what their students needed to be successful people. And they actually would personalize and design both formally and informally um, 
their character education systems around what they perceived their students to need. Mm -hmm. Now, that need, their perception of that need differed significantly by what school we were in. But really the students and, and or excuse me, the teachers and administrators really focused on their students, mm -hmm. um, which I think is probably the case in almost every school around the country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Can you talk a little bit about what some of those needs were, some of those perceived needs? Sure. Um, so when we were studying these schools, uh, we came up with different types of schools, different um, uh, character characterizations of what the schools were and what they valued. Um, and the first type that we came up with that we called the equity charters. Um, equity charters, the teachers and administrators were laser focused on achieving what they saw as racial and class equity in America. Mm -hmm. These were schools that were predominantly um, African-American or Hispanic students, um, very high free or reduced price lunch, which we use as a measure for poverty. Um, so what does that mean? That means that these schools were very low income schools. And the teachers, as teachers tend to be in America, were middle class, majority white, um, uh, disproportionately black and Hispanic as compared to other schools, but again, as most teachers are majority white, uh, middle class, um, and there for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. They saw their school as a way to help those students overcome the achievement gaps in American society um, and a way to get them out of those neighborhoods um, to try and and not only guarantee their their intellectual safety, if you were, their intellectual growth, but also in a lot of cases, their personal safety. Mm -hmm. A lot of teachers told us that we want to give our kids these tools to get out of these neighborhoods because these neighborhoods are not safe. These kids are going to be shot. Um, so this was a mission yeah. <laughs> for these teachers, um, very much so. So those were the, the equity charters, and that's what I saw in a lot of those schools. Um, we also found other schools where when the, the racial and class background of the teachers and the students matched, so in schools that were predominantly white and higher income um, students, the teachers were much less focused on getting students out of a place because why would they? Sure. And these were perfectly nice, safe neighborhoods. These were the neighborhoods that the teachers themselves grew up in in some cases. Um, so they, instead of focusing, teaching um, students uh, morality as a means of getting them out of a situation, mm -hmm. um, so very much focused on the academic. Um, I always say that the equity charters focus on the, the, the good person is the good student. Mm -hmm. Okay. Whereas for a lot of those other schools, the good person wasn't necessarily a good student because they weren't worried about their students' survival. The good person could be a good artist. The good person could be a nice person, right? Mm -hmm. I never heard the word nice used in an equity, equity charter. Um, so there was a lot more freedom allowed because the teachers were not as personally worried about the, the long-term um, job market and personal survival of their students. That makes sense. That makes sense. But would you say that in both type or in all types of the charter schools, there was some emphasis on character formation? Yes, undoubtedly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I know, I know in your chapter, um, you said that there tended to be a lot of um, agreement among teachers about what a good person looks like and um, how to achieve that goal. Um, even when there was, um, maybe discrepancy between the different schools that within a school there was agreement. How do you think that was that teachers were mostly on the same page about that definition and about how to achieve that goal? Um, it's a combination of self-selection and acculturation. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that charters have that allow them to develop a greater uniformity of culture that your traditional public schools do not have is the fact that um, Almost universally, the charter school principal is able, and other administrators, um, they are able to hire their own teachers. So they have a great deal of agency in determining who teaches at their school. So it makes a lot of sense. Why would they hire someone who they didn't think was a good fit? 
culture fit for that school. And then uh, I also found in a lot of these schools, not all of them, but a lot of them, the acculturation process and, and the onboarding process, if you will, for a lot of the teachers was um, all encompassing mm -hmm. and very powerful. Mm -hmm. um, especially because a lot of these schools, charter schools are, are sort of infamous for having younger teachers, right? Newer teachers. Um, so of course, newer teachers are going to be more likely younger people are going to be more likely to fully buy in to a culture system um, and let that, you know, almost like a path dependency way, let that affect what type of teacher they become. Path dependency is the idea that um, smaller changes, when you get someone early, the smaller little changes that you can make to them and the smaller little effects will have larger effects later on that you couldn't have done if you didn't get to them early. Gotcha. And it's, so it's a combination of self-selection and acculturation um, to get that uniformity. Um, and if a lot of teachers, if they didn't buy into the system, they left mm -hmm. um, either through being fired or through quitting. Mm -hmm. Okay, makes sense. Um, what were some of the means that you saw where character formation was happening? Um, does that question make sense? Just yes. kind of what, yeah, what kind of methods? Yeah. Um, so in the equity schools, the ones that I talked about before that were predominantly low income African American students um, and Hispanic students, um, they had disproportionately were likely to have formal, very formal um, mm -hmm. systems with merits and demerits. Um, and so the teacher in some cases could spend as much time, um, particularly at the beginning of the year, they told me, doing uh, character work. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? Um, they would be at the front of the room giving a lecture and they would say, you know, um, John, demerit for not sitting up straight. Mm -hmm. Susan, merit for tracking. Tracking meaning looking at me with your eyes. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, Luis, um, to merit for, you know, leaving your seat to do a pencil sharpening, whatever, you get the point. Yeah. Um, so it was highly micromanaging students' behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and they told me that they disproportionately did it at the beginning of the year, again, in a path dependency effect. They wanted to make sure that they were harder at the beginning so they could loosen up later. Um, and they would do things like the 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 mottos and the school's virtues would be plastered everywhere. And, you know, the traditional things like this month is resilience. Next month is excellence. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and they would have students write reflection essays. The teachers would be have to have uh, at least one lesson a week that touched on that virtue. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, really incredibly formal, highly structured, um, systems that everybody had to buy in to. Mm -hmm. You don't have a choice in the matter. Um, and then the teachers would spend a lot of time tallying up things. They had an app that they could do on their iPads that, you know, like a plus or minus for each student. So they couldn't, it would centralize and sync to the school computer immediately. Um, which I don't know about you, but I, I would lose track of that immediately <laughs> if I were at the front <laughs> of the room. <laughs> for sure. Um, but, you know, they would have things like at the end of the week, the student with the most points could do this and students who didn't have enough points couldn't do that. And, you know, it was, yeah, it was a big deal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas at the schools that particularly at the oldest school in my sample, um, which was founded in the nineties, which for a charter school, that's actually really old. Okay. Um, yeah. cause charter schools only started in, in, I think 1991. Okay. So that's, that's, you know, the founding father here yeah. that we're yeah. talking about here. Um, that school in talking to the principal actually started as an equity charter, okay. did those sort of things with highly formal behavior modification, uh, systems that were masquerading as character education systems. But that principal who had been around since the school's founding and the other faculty tell me that they deliberately relaxed from that over the years, that they weren't getting good long-term results, that okay. they weren't actually teaching the character education stuff that they wanted to. They, they felt that it was um, way too much of an external locus of control. Okay, yeah. And that when the students left this 
incredibly structured environment. Mm -hmm. um, they regressed mm -hmm. in, in their words, regressed mm -hmm. to behaviors that the teachers and administrators didn't like. So instead in this school, they focus more on relationships mm -hmm. with, um, with the students. Mm -hmm. um, and they, uh, it was just a, the word that I kept on um, thinking when I was writing up my field notes at this school was calm. Mm. this school was calm mm. like nobody was rushing around like they were in the equity charters mm -hmm. you know there wasn't as much emphasis on the academic achievements mm -hmm. it was just we're we're a chill school <laughs> <laughs> okay right. um and so they were much more focused on informal stuff okay um they wanted they still had you know academic lessons and they still had the mottos on the walls and all mm -hmm. that um, but the behavior modification system was based on the teacher talking to students and taking them out to the hallway and what's going on in your life. And, you know, maybe we need to have a class meeting about the fact that Johanna is having a rough time. And um, so the, the criticism that, of course, the equity charters would make of this is that um, the equity charters almost universally had 95, 96, 97% graduation rates and college attendance rates rock star yeah statistics Amazing. rock star yeah the relational charter didn't have that mm. now they were doing better they were doing a lot better mm -hmm. than the comparative public school mm -hmm. down the street mm -hmm. um in fact i think I'm, I'm deliberately fuzzing numbers so that the school is not identifiable sure. but i'm pretty sure the relational charter had a graduation rate of about 80 percent, which is okay. still excellent for an urban area mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um with lower income students um but it didn't have the same college attendance. They said that instead of focusing on necessarily academic skills, getting the kids to go to college, um, they had also a push towards vocational school. Mm -hmm. you so know, plus, a different goal in mind, even of yeah. the character formation. Yeah, very much so, yeah. yeah. Um, and a very different way of doing it. And you know, uh, long-term, the, the relational charter, the one that focused on relationships, had more data mm -hmm. um, than the equity charters. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, will the equity charters turn into relational charters over time? Eh, maybe no. one, every one, one in 10, maybe. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So not a common model, but. One I don't think so. Yeah. 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 And did the principal who had been around for a while feel that with the relational model, the good behavior or the moral formation was continuing beyond the, the walls of the school? More yeah. Okay. Yeah. He thought so because he thought that he was really modeling that um, you don't have to be enemies with authority. Mm. Um, and I don't, I absolutely don't think that the equity charters set themselves up so that the teachers and administrators were the students' enemies. And far from it. I, I certainly don't want to malign them and say that. Um, but I do think that students, particularly teenagers, chafe mm. at constant behavior modification. Mm -hmm. And even though they understood the reason why and agreed with it, like when I talked to the students, they were bought in. Mm. Nobody likes being told to sit up straight. Right. <laughs> like, um, so it, it was just a different model. Sure, sure. What, in what ways did the relational charter school foster those relationships? Um, so a lot of it was uh, smaller class sizes. They took in a lot fewer people. If we think back to that X, Y, Z definition, um, their X was smaller. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it was uh, because they had been around for so long, they had more money. They had an endowment. Okay. And so they were able to have more teachers. They were able to do things like take trips to um, certain foreign countries. Mm -hmm. They were able to... Um, uh, have more electives where the te the students could be with teachers who they really wanted to hang out with. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of it was just the culture of, instead of the teachers um, spending time on a lot of paperwork, the idea was to spend time with the kids. Mm -hmm. Now, again, I mean, when I say that, everybody's like, yeah, of course they should spend more time with the kids and less on paperwork. Mm -hmm. um, that means that they spent less time on lesson planning and they spent less time on no data analysis and stuff. Again, this is all a double-edged sword. Right. Right. Um, I don't want to set up one particular charter to be, you know, the be-all, end-all here of character education. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. 
Um, well, just transitioning a bit, um, you did touch on the character trait of grit, which has yeah. kind of become a popular a buzzword. idea, a buzzword, yeah. yes, especially <laughs> in the world of, of charter schools, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And you did uh, mention that there are several critiques of this concept. And so I just wondered if you could kind of explain um, what those are and what your perspective is. Sure. So the name, of course, who everybody associates with GRID is, is Dr. Duckworth, right? Um, Angela Duckworth, who uh, was a professor of mine when I was an undergraduate, actually. Yeah. Um, and she uh, has come, came up with the concept of GRID and said that a lot of how and if we succeed is not necessarily based on intelligence, but how based on perseverance. How much are you willing to fail and get back up, right? And so this became a really quick buzzword, particularly in um, education research that focused on lower income students, because there was this idea, um, uh, some people approached it as a deficiency model. These kids don't have enough grit. We need to teach grit. We need to teach them how to fail. There's too much learned helplessness in the low income. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you can tell by the way that I'm saying that, that I think that that is uh, misguided and in some cases racist. Yes. Yep. Um, there is another model that talks about the fact that um, grit is not just how willing you are to fail and how willing you are to persevere. It's also about what you're persevering in. Mm. Um, so I explain it this way when I talk to my students about it, that um, grit is a muscle, right? You can build up your perseverance over time mm -hmm. um, if you work at it more and more and more and more. But the same way that a muscle fatigues after being used too much in a given day, mm -hmm. so does grit. Mm. And if you are a low income person and using up all your grit on taking care of little sister, mm -hmm. finding food, getting yourself to school, dealing with clothes and laundry, you don't have a ton left for dealing with this horrible social studies teacher who's trying to get you to learn the trail of tears. Right. What, what does that have to do with my life? Yes. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but by the same token, your middle class, your higher income kids who don't have to think about food or transportation or shelter because mom and dad have got it, um, can exercise that grit muscle on the academic stuff. Yeah. So when they get a paperback that has got dripping with red ink, they know that if they work hard enough on their next paper, it'll be better. Mm -hmm. the, the lower income students gets the paper back dripping with red ink and just has no energy to deal with that and has learned that all they're going to do is fail in school. Yeah. Why would they try? Mm -hmm. um, so it's not that something is intrinsically wrong with the lower income students. Far from it. Far from it. It's that the structure and the system that they're in is not allowing them to succeed, to develop and and. Um, showcase the type of grit that they actually have. Mm -hmm. That's good. I wish there was, I, I want to ask you, so what's the solution? But I know that's, <laughs> that's a big question, right? <laughs> um, I, you know, a lot of the schools that I studied um, spent a lot of time thinking about this um, because they're not stupid people. They're very intelligent people who care yeah. a great deal about their students. They know exactly what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, in many cases, I learned that from them. Um, and so they had systems in place, particularly in the lower income schools, that, the equity schools that had a lot of uh, very, very poor students, um, where students could bring their laundry to school and do their laundry there. Um, of course, they had the free and reduced price, you know, breakfast and lunch, almost every school does. Um, but they had um, dress up clothes, like a closet where people could donate stuff to. They had... Um, uh, teachers who are willing to teach students about makeup skills to go into a professional setting, um, all that sorts of thing. A lot of what they were trying to do was trying to teach cultural capital mm -hmm. um, and trying to give these students the skills and the signifiers that are valued mm -hmm. by middle class white America. Mm -hmm. Now, that opens a whole other can of worms about like race and racism and, you know, are these the white savior missionaries right. um, that I do get into a little bit in the, in the writing, but they're trying, they're doing the best they can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. 
Um, another issue that I thought was really interesting that you touch on was um, how in the equity charter schools, the public and private virtues are difficult to separate. Mm -hmm. um, could you just explain a bit, uh, first of all, what you mean by the difference between private and public virtues and then kind of how, how are those interconnected in, in that type of charter school? Sure. So uh, public virtues would be more along the lines of that which make you a good citizen. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, let's see. Um, really easy examples are, are and kind of silly examples are things like paying taxes and voting and serving on jury duty and um, down to things like, uh, have you seen the trash tag stuff that's going around? Mm -hmm. Do you know that at all? No. It's this whole thing on Instagram and Twitter right now of people who are cleaning up public spaces and then posting the results with trash, the hashtag trash tag. Uh -huh. um, so that I would consider a public virtue, very much so. Sure. Um, that which you utilize to make not only your local community, but the larger community at large a better place, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. Public virtue, or excuse me, private virtue is more about that which is going to improve me as a person. Um, so, and of course the two are connected, right? These things are, are certainly not perpendicular, right? Sure. right. Um, but, uh, there is a difference between me, um, making sure that, uh, I have healthy food in the house and me making sure that I get up early to do, you know, write on the next book mm -hmm. that as a connection with who I am as a, as, and certainly will affect my community, but not as directly. Sure. Right. It's more about affecting me. Right. Right. So your question about how are these things difficult to separate in the equity charters, I think is a really good one um, because the teachers and administrators in those equity charters, the lower income, predominantly black and Hispanic schools, um, they are attempting to teach their students academic and professional skills mm -hmm. in the hopes of uh, improving the communities that the students are in. And it's a really overtly stated, um, clear mission mm -hmm. that almost every teacher was willing to just come out and say mm -hmm. um, that they were trying to, um, uh, no, I only heard one teacher, no, I heard more than one teacher say this. This was the only teacher who said this, this baldly. Mm -hmm. He said, we are trying to erase what's happening at home so that we can give them these skills, the correct skills, to go to college, get a good education, and become a professional in the hopes that this achievement gap will um, go away, not just by the fact that that person's children will then be better educated, that mm -hmm. student's children, I mean, yeah. but also that the student will turn around and come back and try and help their mm -hmm. natal community. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, I never heard that was the only time I heard it that baldly that we're trying to erase yeah. the at home. Yeah. Um, most teachers soft peddled that mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. talked about, we're trying to give them additional skills yeah. or we're trying to give them, you know, the, the idea of code switching. Sure. Right. Um, but that was something that they were definitely trying to do that we are trying to give these people these students knowledge and skills that they will need to succeed in college and in a middle class um, to higher income labor, mar labor market. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in this, the charter schools that are not um, equity charter schools, what was the relationship between public and private virtue there? Um, so let's see, uh, really, I'll give you another example. Another one that I, I went to, I call it the utility charter, um, mostly because um, I'll, I'll back up. Um, this school is one of the top performing high schools in the country. Forget charter public altogether. It was one of the top performing high schools in the country. Um, I was actually kind of surprised they let me in, but <laughs> they were cool with it. All right. Right. Um, <laughs> and so the really interesting thing about this school is that, uh, this was a charter school that was, um, near, uh, trying to talk again without giving away what the school is. Right. Um, its predominant population was uh, professors' children. Okay. Um, and so it was, and, and the teachers, of course, knew that, and the teachers were from the same sort of background. Okay. So when my Arias and I went in um, to talk to a bunch of different people, um, 
they were all kind of surprised that mm -hmm. we wanted to talk to them about character education mm -hmm. because they were so used to people coming in and asking them about like academic stuff. How are you doing this academically? Yeah. That asking questions about like character stuff, they, they, what? <laughs> Um, so Not then category, no, no, total, yeah. totally out of left field for them. Yeah. Um, and so they, and this is actually where I got the clue where the, the penny dropped mm -hmm. that it was actually the match between the teachers and the students that was doing the work because yeah. there was such a clear match here between the teachers and the students. Mm -hmm. Um, in a lot of cases, the students were the teacher's kids, oh, wow. okay. um, that they didn't actually care about character education. Like I asked them about character education. They said, you mean like behavior systems? And they said, we don't really do that here. And I said, no, no, how do you, you know, how do you teach what it means to be a good person? And they all like, this was a brand new idea. Mm. Interesting. Beca because it was so, um, the, they were so similar that they, mm -hmm. A, they trusted the parents to do it. Mm -hmm. And B, they didn't have to teach it because it's sort of like a fish was in water. A fish doesn't realize it's in water. Right. Right. Um, it was so uh, such a cohesive, um, tightly coupled system between at home and at school that um, I never saw a teacher overtly uh, remonstrate with a student, remonstrate with a student. Mm -hmm. They would just look at the student out of the corner of their eye and the student would just shut down whatever they were doing. Like, wow. not a problem. Just in lockstep. Lockstep. So there was no, there was no need to do that, right? Um, to, to be that overt about it. So to talk about it in the other schools, um, this school actually didn't, it did do it. They said they didn't do it, but they did do it. Mm -hmm. They said they didn't do it because it was so natural to them. Uh -huh. um, whereas in the other schools, they had to be so overt and so um, clear about it because it was not as natural. Yes, that makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. And so did the other schools that were aware that they were doing it make a distinction between private and public virtues? Um, let's see. I'm thinking about the, the last school that I haven't, last type of school that I haven't talked about at all, which is the Virtue Charter. And mm -hmm. oh my goodness, I love this school. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that school? Sure. So I love that. That was a great school. That was fabulous. Um, <laughs> Uh, this was a school where you, you walk in the door and the students had, um, uh, in art class, had, um, each had a square of paper and each student's job was to do a square of a mural of a larger painting so mm -hmm. that when all the students put their pieces of paper together, the painting was, was, um, sort of up on the wall for everybody to see, was copied on the wall for everybody to yeah. see. Remarkably effectively too. Um, they were really good. I could never have pulled that off. <laughs> Sounds impressive. Yeah. Um, and so uh, you would see, um, let's see, Aristotle, uh, Plato, um, Diogenes, you know. Mm -hmm. um, one student in particular talked about um, the nature of the philosopher king from Plato. Like, mm -hmm. My RA asked her the question of who is a good person, and this is what this 15-year-old comes out with. Oh. Okay. <laughs> All right. We're going there, kid. <laughs> um, and so this was a school that was very focused on those, those um, classical virtues. Truth. Yeah. What mm -hmm. is truth? What is beauty? Right? Mm -hmm. What is the nature of man? Yeah. Um, and I use the phrase nature of man deliberately because that's what the way they would have put it. Yeah. Um, and they were more focused on the idea of being a well-rounded person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so this was a school that was in a very wealthy area. Um, mm -hmm. It was predominantly white, although not completely okay. so. Um, uh, and again, it was very open to having us come in and talk to their kids. Mm -hmm. So to go back to your question of public versus private virtue, um, there I didn't actually see a ton of separation mm -hmm. um, either. Mm -hmm. Like the equity schools, there wasn't a ton of separation. Yeah, but for a very different reason. Mm -hmm. um, the equity schools, the the virtues, the public and private virtues were, you know, how to be a good student, how to succeed academically, how to succeed professionally, okay. and you know, a good student is a good person, is a good citizen. Yeah. Um, here, 
they wanted you to be a good student. I mean, there were consequences if you mm -hmm. failed tests or you didn't do your homework. Um, but it was much more about a good person contemplates the nature of reality mm. and contemplates the nature of virtue. Okay. Because they were they were in a wealthy area, again, not worried about their kids not surviving. Mm -hmm. They had the space, mm -hmm. the mental space to do that, to mm -hmm. think about those things. Um, so, uh, again, I think that those teachers and those students would say that the private virtue of being truthful in your own life leads to uh, uh, the public virtue of um, demanding integrity from, okay. for example, one's politicians. Sure. Well, thank you. Thank you for explaining that and for this entire conversation. It's been really fascinating to learn about your research and um, just appreciate you taking the time to speak with me today. Oh, it's good to, it's good to talk about it. I'll talk anyone's ear off. <laughs> <laughs>